Khalid, you are the Managing Director of Sahara Wind, um, a project I'm sure you will also briefly introduce yourself that tries to harvest just some of the best wind regimes in Morocco that are there around the world. And you will share with us latest developments in the Maghreb region. Khalid. With great pleasure, uh, Stefan. Uh, we have actually a region that is uh, indeed uh, fairly windy. Uh, on the western side, we got huge potential in the center, and we've got the picture that uh, is uh, varying between countries, and uh, the, the picture is not uh, always the same. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, discuss, present rather uh, those prospects. And so I'm going to start uh, westwards, uh, Tunisia, uh, westwards towards the Atlantic, ending to Mauritania, and present the perspective of uh, different countries. And uh, of course, I'm not going to talk about the Libyan situation because I'm not very versed into the situation in this country. Uh, if we talk about Tunisia, uh, what is interesting is uh, we get very high renewable energy targets that have been set already in 2017. But uh, as far as wind is concerned, there is very limited capacity which have been rolled out uh, to date. Uh, in fact, the country is behind on its 2020 targets, which should have been 1.68 gigawatts uh, and has reached only about 240 uh, megawatts, which were already built a while ago. So uh, besides the closing deal of the Sidi Mansour wind farm uh, of 30 megawatts and uh, the announcement that 120 megawatts on four sites have been, uh, have been selected, there is not much news since the last update uh, on wind energy trends in the region. And so uh, there is progress in PV, I believe uh, COVID uh, uh, impacts uh, have been uh, slowing uh, the rollout of uh, wind energy in, in Tunisia. And so we expect uh, the next uh, few months, uh, we expect some, some growth in that market. With that, I'd like to shift to uh, the country westwards. As I had mentioned, we're moving westwards towards the Atlantic. And we've got the, Algeria, the Algerian case, the Algerian wind uh, uh, energy situation with a very, very limited capacity of 10 megawatts in a country which a recent study uh, funded by the International Finance Corporation with the various uh, uh, companies, Everzone, Vortex, and also the global, uh, the, the GWEC, uh, has identified uh, onshore wind energy potential of 7,700 gigawatts. So this is huge potential. Unfortunately, uh, it is not tapped uh, at all to date. And uh, the Algeria National uh, Program of uh, Renewable Energy aims to reach 22 gigawatts in 2030. It has been uh, announced, it had been initiated in 2012, has been officially announced in 2015, and uh, it's very limited in its uh, rollout with wind uh, almost absent in it. I believe this program is essentially focused on PV, uh, but uh, five gigawatt of wind are supposed to be online by 2030, of which none has been installed to date. And it's, uh, it's a bit disappointing because of the tremendous wind potential that uh, Algeria has. And uh, we expect, uh, hopefully, stimulus packages to, to be able to uh, implement those uh, wind capacities in the region. Uh, there is uh, obviously uh, lots of room for Algeria to grow in the wind energy sector. And I will show you also some aspects where uh, wind and also with European Green Deal, hydrogen uh, technologies could kick in, in in the region. If you look at the Morocco's wind energy sector is the most, the largest, of course, in the Maghreb region, uh, the oldest and the most uh, more steady, we got about 1.2 gigawatts of operational capacity, the majority of which is operational on the Sahara uh, trade wind blown coastline with a vari variety of players. We're going to see how the industry uh, has, uh, has done with the COVID 19 crisis. Uh, basically, 
uh, there is a middle wind farm as part of the uh, 850 integrated wind energy program of Morocco, which has been implemented. The team was stretched to the limit. There has been no rotation possible, but they did manage in middle to build the 180 megawatt wind farm to complete it. It is not yet commissioned, but it is completed. And the 300 megawatt uh, bush door wind farm has been, uh, the deal has been closed. So now it's being uh, constructed as is uh, uh, first phase of the 150 megawatt Taza wind farm, of which 80, 80, 87 megawatts are being now uh, constructed. So it's going to be split in two phases. Instead of the 150 megawatts in one phase, it's going to be split in two phases. Uh, we're still waiting uh, to hear about the 30 megawatt Walidia wind farm, uh, which is pretty much in construction. As for the rest, uh, we'll have to wait probably until 2021 for uh, the announcements to be made. So I think Morocco is on track for uh, meeting uh, about two gigawatts of power by end of 2022. And, uh, and moving on, uh, you got uh, more interesting prospects that I'm happy to uh, present. Of course, the region, uh, Morocco has a significant wind technical uh, potential of 6,000 gigawatts onshore uh, that could produce 11,500 terawatt hours. This is due to the trade winds. Uh, obviously, the trade winds are offset compared to Moroccan energy electricity load centers. So that's a challenge, the transfer from that region to the north of Morocco. And also the local contents are increasing thanks to an industrial consolidation. Uh, Siemens Camesa has really taken the lead in that market with about 77% of uh, market share of uh, wind turbines, and it has set a regional hub for uh, wind blade manufacturing, 80% uh, dedicated to export, and there's also progress in uh, building local towers with local steel, namely, so all that uh, are positive signals to the industry. Now, what is more interesting here to note uh, with the wind targets of Morocco, according to Mazen in uh, last month, it has mentioned that the, the COVID crisis had actually no direct impact on the energy targets of 52% that Morocco has by 2030. In fact, these are likely to be reached by 2026. So there's new targets that are now estimated by 2030 to be at 60, 65% of renewable energy capacity. And uh, that translates into additional wind capacity of about four gigawatts. And it's interesting to note that this can be exceeded with the power to x projects. Morocco is going to host the first, uh, not only demo project uh, in, uh, in uh, partnership with Germany, with the German hydrogen uh, uh, energy strategy, hydrogen strategy rather, because it's a multiple hydrogen uh, application strategy and the pilots. The pilots will essentially look at how Morocco's uh, global fertilizer industry can switch to from gray ammonia imports of about 2 million tons to green ammonia. So this just shifting Morocco's imports of gray ammonia into green ammonia will translate into a capacity of about 8 gigawatts supplemental wind capacity. So this is tremendous capacity that are, that are likely to be added probably before 2030 thanks to the German hydrogen strategy and also the, the European uh, hydrogen strategy, which now consolidate uh, partnerships in the south of the Mediterranean, namely with Morocco in, as, the first, uh, as the first operator and implementer of this strategy. So what is also interesting to note is that uh, on the operation, uh, grid operator side, uh, COVID-19 has presented a tremendous challenge. Obviously, uh, there has been uh, uh, excess generating capacity, excess fossil fuel generating capacity. Renewables have been uh, uh, feeding uh, a larger capacity in the, in the grid, so this is good news. But uh, the drop in electricity consumption of about 14% has uh, moved, shifted uh, loads towards from industry towards residential use. And because of the COVID crisis, a lot of these homes have lacked uh, incomes. So uh, the utility has had 
about 11 million of outstanding electricity uh, bills which have not been paid. So this is going to put a burden on the on the grid operator ONEE of Morocco. And so that is why it's important uh, that the policy signals and the regulatory environments uh, need to be put in place to mobilize the capital and attract uh, private sector investment also in the transmission distribution and grid infrastructure. And that is why Morocco has created uh, two, three days ago, Morocco's strategic management of public assets, an agency that will be in charge of managing uh, strategic assets from the phosphate conglomerate to as well the utility ONEE. And we believe that this could lead to a conducive framework for an HVDC uh, line to connect uh, the Sahara coastline to uh, the loads north of Morocco and enabling uh, exchanges with Europe. And we're talking about a line that is 1,200 kilometers long, uh, which uh, Sahara Wind has advocated for uh, the last uh, 15 years. Uh, if you look at Mauritania's wind energy picture, uh, it's also interesting that uh, now uh, the country has limited the wind capacity, but it's also a very small grid, and the challenge is to integrate wind energy in Mauritania's grid. There is a 100 megawatt uh, Siemens Gamesa renewable uh, energy wind farm at Boulinoir, close to Mouadibou, where the export of iron ore uh, is being made. And so the substation tests have been completed regardless, uh, I mean, they're almost completed uh, regardless of the COVID situation. And uh, the line will also, uh, the line connecting Noadibu with Nwakshot will be commissioned by end of 2020. So you can really see that not only will be the wind farm commissioned, but the line feeding into uh, not only uh, uh, um, Nwakshot, but also Mauritania's connection to uh, the ECOWAS uh, economic zone and the grid towards Senegal and Mali. There are some grid expansions that are also planned. And uh, the mix between the grid expansions and the future power to X applications for uh, reducing, direct reducing the iron ore into uh, carbon emission free steel are tremendous in the region. And I believe that this will also lead to uh, projects which can be implemented with uh, not only uh, uh, individual country strategy, we talked about Germany's hydrogen strategy, we talked also about France's 7 billion euro hydrogen strategy and, and Europe's uh, hydrogen strategy. I believe these are the early movers into decarbonizing the steel industry in, uh, in the world. And so I'm going to just conclude with uh, showing you where most of the phosphate deposits are located, 72% of the world's phosphate deposits, which is actually a fossil footprint from the trade winds blowing uh, in the region. And in red, you can see the iron ore deposits of the region, which are tremendous and that are, that are being exported on the Atlantic coastline. And so that, that, that shows you how uh, actually these carbon-free processes are likely to uh, decouple uh, the installed capacity, the expected installed wind capacities in the region. And so the idea is really uh, to power not only uh, clean energy uh, on regional basis towards uh, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and enabling exchanges to Europe, but also decarbonize major, uh, major uh, energy intensive uh, and carbon emission intensive industries, namely the steel and the fertilizer, uh, global fertilizer industry. And with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Uh, I'm, of course, open to questions. Thanks so much, Khalid. I think that was an excellent overview of what is happening in the uh, market countries um, and also making some reference to uh, the, the COVID situation and the impact that has. So what I understand from you uh, is that actually, and we heard it also from other countries, that it rather leads to increasing the targets. On the one hand, it seems to be easier now because the electricity consumption is going down everywhere but also obviously governments are changing priorities. That is good news. That's certainly uh, one of the, the conclusions we can take also from here. And that there's one comment for you, I would say it's rather a comment, but I think it's good if you can react on that uh, um, from Alexandra Wagner. I think it is important 
it's much more important to re green degraded landscape and draw down CO2 and reduce it to black coal and keep it safe underground, no need for hydrogen. The, the other part, better reduce consumption, useless transport and beef, I think is not much so much related to your specific presentation that certainly um, uh, valid statements, but uh, um, Khalid, do you want to react on that, the role of hydrogen that you've presented? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, obviously hydrogen is important in the region, not because it's a European hype or a global hype, it's essentially uh, important because uh, and we have introduced the first hydrogen projects in the region uh, uh, a decade ago because uh, it is on the critical path to accessing wind energy on weak grids. And the main load in the region, in fact, are the mine processing industries, which are actually not processing much of the mine. They're just cleaning the, the export of uh, raw materials because of a lack of uh, energy to process uh, these, uh, these minerals. So. Hydrogen is important because if, uh, first of all, hydrogen in the economy, 70% uh, of that hydrogen is to produce ammonia. And one of the main customers of ammonia, of imported gray ammonia in the world is Morocco. And so if you have plenty of wind and you can produce CO2 free uh, ammonia, uh, and if you can do that, you are reinforcing regional grids and the access to wind electricity, enabling a transfer of wind industry, enabling, facilitating also the access to electricity in a continent that, uh, that lacks uh, significant access to electricity. I believe 580 million people still do not have access to electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa. So anything that is clean, anything that provides access to electricity and uh, opens uh, access to one of the world's cheapest wind electricity, we're talking about two cents per kilowatt hour, probably a little lower, the price of ammonia is also competitive with fossil fuels on that scale. So I think you are in an energy transition path that should not be uh, either underestimated nor neglected because uh, this will enable countries that are 90% uh, uh, energy dependent on fossil fuel imports to become uh, actually not only independent, but clean energy exporter in terms of uh, clean fertilizer, or perhaps also green hydrogen, which can also enable both the grids in Africa and in Europe to integrate more uh, intermittent uh, renewable energies and also uh, strengthen the grids and store also uh, uh, renewable energies on a seasonal basis. So and decarbonize uh, mobility, etc. But the argument that is being made on coal is a good one because as Morocco didn't have access, uh, had a high dependency on fossil fuels, it opted to power its electricity with coal-fired power plants because it's the cheapest way to produce fossil generated electricity. And uh, they are of course very polluting. Another challenge is to make sure that these plants can be decommissioned as soon as possible and substituted by uh, tremendous amounts of uh, renewable electricity uh, from solar and wind mostly because we have 70% capacity factor of wind electricity in the south. So that will be the challenge. It will be an economic challenge because obviously those are stranded, will gradually become stranded assets in the region. But this is an economic choice that has been made when Morocco did not have uh, uh, access to electricity and was looking for a cheapest source of electricity. And when wind energy was still expensive, now with the dropping cost of both wind and solar, it becomes economically uh, justified to shift into renewable energy and with storage and hydrogen technology to go really for 100% renewables, if not more, because then you'll be able to export uh, green electrons and green molecules as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I think it is very good to hear your perspective, which is, of course, uh, shows that this the, the, the whole hydrogen topic is a bit more complex. And sometimes the discussion, of course, is, is just about cars and whether to use cars and fuel cells or batteries. That is certainly where I think at the moment it's very clear the answer. Um, hydrogen in fuel cells is not competitive, but there are many more uh, applications that you just highlighted 
in the industrial applications, etc. Long term, we have to see which role hydrogen can play in storage, etc. Which I think requires, of course, different debates. And we tried to have that before. We'll have that uh, extra. But I think, uh, anyway, good to hear different uh, perspectives on this. Then again, thank I, I you. May, I may, Stefan, just before we conclude, I, I want to yeah. mention that these hydrogen technologies are accessible because they're modular, they're on smaller scale, mm -hmm. and they affect industries. If you take the steel industry, it's 8% of the world's total carbon emissions. So this is huge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, airplane is about 12%. So it's almost like all the aviation industry that you can... Uh, that you can shift from uh, emission, uh, carbon emission to zero emission. If you look at the chemical and uh, industry, you have about the same rate. So those are huge opportunities to eliminate carbon emission from the atmosphere, which cannot be uh, underestimated. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. I just wanted to say that sometimes the discussion is just about which role uh, hydrogen can play in cars, and that I think it's where we would not start now, but it's obvious the first steel production starts now with hydrogen, where you also use the whole, I mean, energy which is in, uh, you have different, of course, energy uh, efficiency rates, etc. So again, thanks a lot.